ever feel like your immune system is this big like black box? Yeah, no. Totally. We get it. But what if we told you there's this like simple test that can give you a peek behind the curtain? Yeah. It's all about this thing called IgA, mm -hmm. a uh, key player in your immune system's defense force. Mm -hmm. You sent us a bunch of interesting articles and research on this IgA test, what it is, why it's done, and what the results mean. Right. So today, we are taking a deep dive into uh, the IgA test. To help you understand this powerful little test, yeah. think of IgA as like your body's frontline security team. Okay. Strategically stationed in those areas where germs love to sneak in, you know, like your nose, yeah. your gut, mm -hmm. anywhere with those moist mucous membranes. Hold on. For those of us who aren't you know, walking medical dictionaries. Sure. What exactly are mucous membranes? Great question. They're basically the linings of your body's openings that are exposed to the outside world. Okay. Like your respiratory system, yeah. your digestive tract, even your eyes. Oh, wow. They act as a barrier yeah. to keep those nasty pathogens out. Interesting. And IgA is right there, standing guard. Okay, so we've got these IgA security guards right. patrolling our mucous membranes. Uh-huh. But how do we know if they're doing their job? That's where this IgA test comes in, right? Right. It's a simple blood test that measures the level of IgA in your system. Okay. It's like a quick checkup to see if your immune defenses are up to par. So this test can tell us if we have enough of these IgA guards on duty? It can. And it can also reveal if there's an overabundance, mm. which can be a sign of other issues. Okay. That's what's so fascinating about the IgA test. Yeah. It's not just a simple yes or no answer. Uh -huh. It gives us this nuanced picture of your immune system's activity. Okay. I'm intrigued. Let's unpack why this test is so important. One of the articles mentions something called uh, immunodeficiency disorders. Mm -hmm. What are those exactly? Think of it as your immune system having a weakened battery. It's still there but it might not have enough power to fight off infections effectively. That's an immunodeficiency disorder. And the IgA test can help diagnose these disorders. Absolutely. Wow. It's one of the key diagnostic tools, especially for a condition called selective IgA deficiency. I read a bit about that one. It's where your body just doesn't produce enough IgA, right? Right. Making you more susceptible to infections. Exactly. Especially those pesky respiratory and gut bugs. You got it. <laughs> And this is where the IgA test becomes so crucial. Early detection can mean the difference between constantly battling infections and staying healthy. Okay, so low IgA can be a problem. Mm -hmm. But then some of the research you sent also talked about high IgA levels. All What's right. going on there? That's where things get even more interesting. Okay. High IgA levels can sometimes be a sign of your immune system going a bit haywire. Oh. Attacking your own body huh. instead of those foreign invaders. This is what happens in autoimmune diseases. So too little IgA is bad, too much IgA is bad. It's all about finding that Goldilocks zone. That's a great way to put it. And the IgA test helps us see where your levels fall on that spectrum. All right, we've got low IgA linked to immunodeficiency. Right. High IgA potentially signaling autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. Are there any other reasons why doctors might order this test? You bet. Yeah. It's also used to assess allergic reactions and to screen for celiac disease. Okay, let's tackle allergies first. I'm curious, how does IgA factor into those sniffles and sneezes? Well, remember, IgA is found in those mucous membranes, uh -huh. including those in your nose and sinuses. Yeah. When you encounter an allergen, like pollen, mm -hmm. your body sees it as a threat and launches an immune response. So my IgA security guards are going into overdrive thinking that harmless pollen is a dangerous intruder. Exactly. And that immune response is what triggers those annoying allergy symptoms. Oh. The runny nose, itchy eyes. Oh, yeah. The whole works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The IgA test can actually help confirm if allergies are the culprit. And what about celiac disease? You mentioned the IgA test is used for screening. What are we looking for there? With celiac disease, the body reacts poorly to gluten, a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. Okay. It's not just a simple intolerance, it actually triggers an immune response in the small intestine. So it's more than just feeling a bit bloated after a pizza. Right. Celiac disease is a serious autoimmune condition. Okay. The IgA test is particularly helpful here because it can detect specific antibodies that are a hallmark of celiac disease. Okay, this is all starting to make sense, but I have to ask, what does a normal IgA level even look like? Good question. Labs typically provide a reference range for IgA levels, 
but keep in mind those ranges can vary slightly between labs. So if my result falls outside that range, should I be hitting the panic button? Not necessarily. Mm. It's all about context. Your doctor will consider your medical history, mm -hmm. any symptoms you are experiencing, and other factors to determine what your IgA results mean for you. So it's not just about the number, it's about the whole picture. Exactly. It's like solving a detective puzzle. Okay. We need all the pieces to see the full story. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground already. Yeah. From what IgA is and where it's found, to the reasons doctors order this test, and how it can shed light on a range of conditions. Mm -hmm. Now let's dive deeper into what those IgA test results actually mean. What happens when those levels are too low? What could be going on? Let's explore that. Okay, so we're talking about how low IgA levels can be a red flag. What's the significance of those low numbers? Well, as we mentioned earlier, low IgA can point to a condition called hypogamma globulinemia. Okay. Which basically means you have lower than normal levels of antibodies. Right. Overall, yeah. not just IgA. Okay. This can make you more susceptible to infections because your immune system doesn't have enough of those protective proteins to fight off the invaders. So it's like having a smaller security force trying to protect a much larger area. They're spread thin and might miss some of those sneaky germs. That's a great analogy. And one of the most common types of hypogamma globulinemia is selective IgA deficiency, right. which we discussed earlier. Uh -huh. It's one of the most common primary immunodeficiency disorders out there. And it specifically affects IgA production. So if someone has recurrent infections, especially those respiratory or digestive infections, selective IgA deficiency might be on the radar. Exactly. And the IgA test can help confirm that suspicion. It's amazing how one simple test can unlock so much information about our immune system's inner workings. It really is. And you mentioned other types of hypogamma globulinemia. Is there another one that's particularly important to know about? Yeah, there's a condition called common variable immunodeficiency, or CVI for short. Okay. It's a bit more complex because it can affect different types of antibodies, not just IgA. Right. And the symptoms can vary widely from frequent infections to autoimmune issues. So CVI is like the wild card of immunodeficiency disorders. It can manifest in different ways. Precisely. And that's why diagnosing it can be challenging. But again, the IgA test can be a helpful piece of the puzzle, especially when combined with other tests and a thorough medical history. Okay, so we've talked about low IgA levels. What about the flip side? What happens when the IgA test shows elevated levels? High IgA levels can be a sign of several different things, and it often requires a bit of detective work to figure out what's going on. Yeah. One possibility, as we mentioned earlier, is an autoimmune disease. Right, because in autoimmune diseases, the immune system gets confused and starts attacking the body's own tissues, like it's fighting off a foreign invader. That's right. And high IgA levels, often referred to as hypergammaglobulinemia, can be a clue that this kind of immune overactivity is happening. Okay. Conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and certain types of inflammatory bowel disease can all cause elevated IgA. So if someone's IgA levels are high, it doesn't automatically mean they have an autoimmune disease, but it's d definitely a sign to investigate further. Exactly. It's like a flashing warning light on your car's dashboard. Mm. It doesn't tell you exactly what's wrong, but it lets you know something needs attention. Makes sense. Are there any other conditions besides autoimmune diseases that can cause high IgA levels? Yes, there are a few others. Chronic infections, for example, mm -hmm. can sometimes lead to elevated IgA as your body tries to fight off the persistent invader. So it's like your immune system is working overtime, pumping out those IgA antibodies to try and keep the infection under control. Precisely. And we can't forget about liver disease. Okay. The liver plays a crucial role in filtering the blood and removing waste products, and when it's not functioning properly, it can sometimes cause IgA levels to rise. Interesting. So liver disease is another piece of the puzzle to consider when interpreting high IgA levels. What about allergies? Do they always cause elevated IgA? Allergies can definitely cause a temporary spike in IgA. Okay. Especially during allergy season when you're exposed to those pesky allergens. So if my IgA levels are high during the spring when the pollen is out in full force, it might just be my immune system waging war on those allergens. Exactly. It's all about understanding the context. Your doctor will look at your symptoms, your medical history, and any other relevant information to determine the most likely cause of elevated IgA. Okay, this is all incredibly fascinating, but I'm also wondering, are there any external factors that can influence IgA levels? Like, can diet or lifestyle play a role? You bet. Several things can affect IgA levels. For instance, age is a big one. 
as we get older, our IgA levels naturally tend to increase. That's interesting. Is there a reason why IgA levels go up as we age? It's not entirely clear, but it might be related to the fact that our immune systems have encountered more pathogens over time and have developed a larger arsenal of antibodies, including IgA. So it's like our immune system is becoming a seasoned veteran with more experience and more weapons in its arsenal. That's a great way to think about it. And this is why older adults are often more susceptible to infections, even though their IgA levels might be higher. It's not that their immune systems are shutting down. Yeah. It's more that they might need a little extra support. That makes a lot of sense. What about gender? Is there a difference in IgA levels between men and women? Some studies have suggested that women might have slightly higher IgA levels than men, but the difference isn't significant enough to be a major factor in diagnosis. Okay, so gender might play a minor role, but it's not a deal breaker. What about genetics? Do our genes influence our IgA levels? Absolutely. Genetics plays a significant role in our immune system's function, including IgA production. If you have a family history of immunodeficiency disorders or autoimmune diseases, you might be more predisposed to having abnormal IgA levels. So family history is definitely something to keep in mind. What about our overall health? Can things like stress or lack of sleep impact our IgA levels? You're right on the money. Stress, lack of sleep, poor diet, and other lifestyle factors can all impact our immune system's ability to function properly. So it's like anything else in our bodies. If we don't take care of ourselves, our immune system can't perform at its best. Exactly. Taking care of our overall health is crucial for maintaining a strong immune system, including healthy IgA levels. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here from what low IgA levels might indicate to the factors that can influence those levels. Now let's shift gears a bit and dive deeper into the clinical significance of the IgA test. How is it used to actually diagnose and manage specific conditions? Let's explore that fascinating aspect. Let's do it. We're back and uh, ready to like connect all the dots here between the IgA test and the diagnosis and management of specific conditions. Yeah. It's pretty amazing how one little test can provide so much information. It really is. It's like having this key that unlocks this whole new understanding of the immune system. So let's talk about how doctors actually use this information in a clinical setting. Perfect. We've already touched on a few conditions like uh, immunodeficiency disorders, autoimmune diseases, allergies, and celiac disease. But let's like dive a little deeper into how the IgA test plays a role in each of these. Great idea. Let's start with immunodeficiency disorders, specifically selective IgA deficiency. Remember, this is where the body just doesn't produce enough IgA, leaving those mucous membranes vulnerable. Right, like having a security shortage at those key entry points. Exactly. The IgA test is often the first step in diagnosing selective IgA deficiency. If the levels are significantly low, it raises a red flag. So that low IgA result prompts further investigation. Absolutely. Doctors will look at the patient's medical history, any recurring infections, and might run additional tests to confirm the diagnosis. And once selective IgA deficiency is diagnosed... How is it managed? There's no cure for selective IgA deficiency, but the focus is on managing the symptoms and preventing infections. That might involve being extra vigilant about hygiene, getting vaccinated against common infections, and sometimes even using antibiotics preventively. So it's about being proactive and taking steps to bolster those weakened defenses. Exactly. Early diagnosis through the IgA test can empower individuals to take control of their health and minimize the impact of the condition. Okay, that makes sense. What about those more complex immunodeficiency disorders like common variable immunodeficiency or CVA? How does the IgA test factor in there? CVE is trickier because it can affect different types of antibodies, not just IgA, but the IgA test can still provide valuable clues. If IgA levels are low, along with other antibody deficiencies, it strengthens the suspicion of CVA. So it's another piece of the puzzle that helps guide the diagnosis. Precisely. And diagnosing CVI is often a process of elimination, ruling out other possibilities and piecing together the clinical picture. Okay, let's move on to autoimmune diseases. I remember you mentioned that high IgA levels can sometimes be a sign of autoimmunity. Can you elaborate on that? Of course. In autoimmune diseases, the immune system mistakenly attacks the body's own tissues as if they were foreign invaders. Mm -hmm. And this immune system overactivity can sometimes lead to elevated IgA levels. So the IgA test isn't a standalone diagnostic tool for autoimmune diseases, but it can raise a red flag that something might be amiss. That's right. It's more of a clue that warrants further investigation. For example, if someone has joint pain and their IgA levels are high, 
it might prompt the doctor to consider rheumatoid arthritis as a possibility and order more specific tests. And once an autoimmune disease is diagnosed, can the IgA test be used to monitor the condition? Absolutely. In some cases, doctors might track IgA levels over time to see if the treatment is working or if the disease is flaring up. So it's not just about diagnosing the condition. It can also be a valuable tool for ongoing management. What about allergies? How does the IgA test help us understand and manage allergic reactions? Well, remember that IgA is found in those mucous membranes, yeah, including the lining of the nose and sinuses. When someone with allergies is exposed to an allergen, their body releases this surge of IgA antibodies to try and neutralize the threat. So those allergy symptoms, like the runny nose and the sneezing, are actually part of the body's immune response. Exactly. And the IgA test can help confirm if allergies are the culprit. If someone has high IgA levels during allergy season, it supports the diagnosis. And knowing that it's allergies and not something more serious can be reassuring. Absolutely. And it can help guide treatment strategies, whether it's avoiding allergens, taking antihistamines, or even considering immunotherapy. Okay, and lastly, let's revisit celiac disease. How does the IgA test help with screening and early detection? Celiac disease is an autoimmune condition triggered by gluten, a protein found in wheat, rye, and barley. The IgA test is incredibly helpful here because it looks for specific antibodies that are a hallmark of celiac disease, particularly those targeting an enzyme called tissue transglutaminase, or TTG for short. I remember you mentioned TTG earlier, but can you remind us why this enzyme is important in celiac disease? Sure. TTG plays a role in how the body processes gluten. In people with celiac disease, when they eat gluten, their immune system mistakenly attacks TTG, causing inflammation and damage to the small intestine. So the IgA test is looking for those antibodies that are attacking TTG. Exactly. And if those antibodies are present in high levels, it's a strong indicator of celiac disease. And why is early detection so crucial with celiac disease? Because ongoing exposure to gluten can lead to long-term complications, including malnutrition, osteoporosis, and even an increased risk of certain cancers. Wow, that's serious. So the IgA test can really be a lifesaver for people with celiac disease. Absolutely. Early diagnosis allows individuals to adopt a gluten-free diet, which is the only effective treatment for celiac disease. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground today, and it's amazing how one simple blood test, the IgA test, can unlock so much information about our immune system and its role in various conditions. It's like having a window into the complex workings of our bodies. It really is, and the more we understand about our immune system, the better equipped we are to make informed decisions about our health. I completely agree. So for our listeners out there, if you've been dealing with recurring infections, allergies, digestive issues, or have a family history of autoimmune conditions, it might be worth having a conversation with your doctor about the IgA test. That's a great takeaway. It could be the missing piece of the puzzle, leading to a diagnosis, effective treatment, and ultimately a healthier you. We hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into the fascinating world of IgA and the IgA test. Remember, knowledge is power, and we encourage you to stay curious about your health. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep taking charge of your well-being.